Who likes Narnia books, kids? Who likes the Chronicles of Narnia? Put your hands up. Adults. I see lots of adults putting their hands up. <laughs> Once I got the big compilation and read them all together, the book was about this thick on one of my holidays. It's just the language, the imagery, it's just fantastic. And so the author who wrote that was called C.S. Lewis, and uh, he's an amazing writer, kids and big kids. He's someone who has some profound things to say about who Jesus is. And this is one of the things that he said. Once in our world, a stable had something in it bigger than our whole world. Once in our world, a stable, an animal, a dirty animal shed had something in it bigger than our whole world. What a great statement. A stinky animal shed. Nothing very glamorous. In fact, I think Mary and Joseph would have felt a bit like, oh, we would have liked to have like a crib. <laughs> would have liked to have something that was a bit more special. But God provided this animal shed. There was no room anywhere else. But God provided and Jesus was born in an animal shed. It had something in it. What? Well, we know. What did it have in it, kids? It had a baby. But not just any baby. A baby that's bigger than our whole world. How can that be? That's amazing. <laughs> Something so wonderful, it's better and far bigger than you can wrap your mind around. And so I want to look at a passage of the Bible that talks about how amazing this baby was and is. We're going to look at John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. It's talking about Jesus, it's talking about this baby. That's amazing. I'm going to skip down to verse 9. It says, The true light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And back in verse 4 it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So actually life itself, God in human form, was in that animal shed, in that manger. That's amazing. It goes on to say in the next verse, verse 10, He was in the world and though the world was made through him, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. I want to share a story about a special thing that happened uh, that I got told about a story about with my nephew. He was given a trampoline last year for Christmas and uh, some of you might have got a trampoline this year. Who got a trampoline? No one. Oh, someone. Someone's put... Jesse, you got one. Awesome. Do lots of bouncing today, okay? <laughs> but he got this special trampoline and, and his parents had pulled the blinds all down and walked outside and, and said... There's your present. He's like, where is it? Because <laughs> he thought a present, which is fair enough when you're three, has to be wrapped and have a big bow on it and make it look super special. And he didn't recognise that this trampoline, this thing that was probably even better than he could even imagine, was actually the present. And do you know, that's what it was like. No one expected Jesus to be born in an animal shed, a stinky animal shed. No one expected God to come to earth the way he did. No one expected that God would humble himself and lower himself to become a baby. So the world did not recognize him. Verse 11 says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The people of Israel that that had been God's people, that he, his special possession, that he had uh, 
been with and helped and that's who Jesus came through, they were the ones who were meant to welcome him and say, oh, it's great. We've been waiting for you. This is awesome. Jesus, you're here, the Messiah, the anointed one. You're finally here. But except for a few, when he actually arrived, many of the response of his own people were hatred or terror. Hatred or terror. They did not receive him. They, because I reckon he didn't fit their picture of God. He didn't fit, he didn't fit what it looked like. They were thinking, I don't want to submit to someone who's going to challenge everything about the way I do life. I just want to control everything and do it how I want. But he came and he said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. You can't know the Father except if you know me. And they didn't like that. It challenged their independence. And then verse 12 We have one little word, yet, Y-E-T, yet. And there's so much promise and hope in this one little word. (laughs) We have all the things that people, they didn't recognize him, they didn't receive him, they didn't want him, they rejected him, they thought he was crazy sometimes. But then you have this little word and it says yet, yet, yet. And that's a word of good news. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And do you know what I was struck with? It doesn't say to all who believed in him, they earned the right. It says he gave the right. It's a gift of God. This ability to become a child of God, to know him, to come alive on the inside to God forever and ever is a gift of grace and it's made freely available through what Jesus has done. He came to this earth as a baby but he didn't stay as a baby. He grew up as a man and he walked this earth and he lived a perfect life and he was spat on and he was rejected and he was abused until he went to fulfill God's plan and die on a horrible cross. Why would he do that? (laughs) Because that was God's purpose for him all along, to actually grow up and be the one who bears the weight of sin, everything that we've ever done wrong on his shoulders. He took the punishment for all the things that you've ever done wrong. Jesus took it on the cross. He took the punishment for anything that you've ever thought wrong. Jesus took it, even though he didn't deserve death, even though he'd done nothing wrong, even though he was perfect, he willingly went to the cross. You know, as we were worshipping before and we're singing the Lord's praises, I had a just a picture in my mind of him standing before us, broken and bloodied and beaten, yet receiving the glory and the honour and the worship for people that he won back to the Father. Broken and bloodied and beaten for you. Why did he do it? Because he loves you so much. Because God loves you. Because Jesus is a demonstration of God's love for you. God's unrelenting, unyielding love that would cause him to come and to die on that cross. Yet to all who who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right, he gave a gift to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband will, but born of God. That you're adopted into God's family. You become his precious child. And instead of punishment that we deserve, we receive 
welcome, acceptance. We receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, which he's poured out, his presence in our life. We sing that carol. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. But then it says, let every heart prepare him room. Have you opened your heart and your life to Jesus? Have you prepared room in your life for him? In response to all he's done for you. In John 1, 14, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That word dwelling is a picture of the Old Testament tent of the tabernacle which held the presence of God. Actually, God, fully God, fully man, the visible image of the invisible God, Jesus, made his dwelling, his very presence among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. You know, this morning God wants you to know that he is with you. He is with you. He is available to any who would receive him. He is with you. He wants to have deep intimacy and relationship with you, the God of heaven. That's outstanding. That's stunning. That's amazing. That's beyond what we can wrap our heads around. He's with you. He wants his presence in your life to be the greatest reality that you know. His presence in your life. You don't have to do life independent of him and on your own goes on to say that we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God is not just with us, but he's for us. He came, this baby in a manger came, full of grace and truth. Grace is God's free, unmerited favour. We can't earn it, we can't buy it, we can't pay it back. It doesn't make sense. It's more wonderful than we could ask or imagine. But it's a gift that God gives us to know him as our heavenly father. And Jesus has made that possible. He's also full of truth. He tells us and speaks truth because he wants the best for our lives. We can actually trust that what he's got to say is going to cause us to flourish because he made us and he made us for himself and he made us to walk with him and to walk in truth as he is truth. Have you made room in your heart for him? Do you know that he's with you? Do you know that he's for you? He's proven it once and for all time. By coming to earth as a baby. That's, you couldn't make that stuff up. God coming to earth as a baby. The Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, getting her pregnant. Jesus being born. God, infinite God, becoming a baby. He did it for you and he did it for me. That same author I talked about, C.S. Lewis, He said an amazing quote, and I want to finish with this. He said, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher... He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg (laughs) or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. 
You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. That he was and is God. Once in our world, a stable held something in it that was bigger than our whole world. God. And he did it for us because he wants to know us. He wants us to know him for full eternity. That's outstanding. That's amazing. That's astonishing. That's awe-inspiring. That's worthy of our worship. 